I am Brady Trantham. I'm going to be hosting this, but the real reason why everybody's here, of course, not just OU football, which of course today uh, practice began for the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, Lincoln Riley, Alex Grinch, and players are made available for the um, OU's media day. So we have all that to kind of discuss and digest and talk about as we prepare for the uh, upcoming season. But the real other reason why everybody's here is um, you can hear him every day, Monday through Friday, on the franchise drive from 6 to 8. Uh, it's Mr. John Hoover, one of the best in the biz at covering OU sports. Um, John, I'm excited to do this. Uh, it's the first podcast of the year uh, for the Inside OU podcast. Uh, I'm excited. Everybody's excited for OU football, of course. And we're getting to that time of year where sports is going to come back after a, you know, just a brief period of like nothing to talk about over the last week and a half. This is definitely my first actual podcast since I left the Tulsa World. Oh, how wow. about that? Oh, uh, oh, been wow. doing radio for three years, three and a half years. Uh, but and we only did when I was at the World the last five years or whatever. You know, we talked about podcasts, but we only did one that whole time. And I was like, you know what? Podcasts are the wave of the future. <laughs> So Hoover's trying to get on board here. Yeah. All those millennials and their podcasts. You know, we, we've got to we've got to figure out some ways to be relevant, especially when you know um, the more talented people. I, I should say, like you, you know, you've got you've got everything pinned down in terms of writing, in terms of content, and uh, having a microphone and a computer in your car, sitting in a parking lot on <laughs> campus corner. That's about as close as we can get. Sometimes we're and, not even in a parking lot. We're on the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm just holding one microphone, so, I mean, if this video goes up later on, which, uh -huh. man, I did not shave, I realized, <laughs> as I can looking, see. You're looking uh, <laughs> earthy. Yeah, dang it. How about that? Oh, well, oh, well. This is, hey, man, it's a podcast. What are we supposed to do? Like, shave and, and change our underwear? Come on. Hell, I, I do I do the <laughs> OKC82 podcast with my boxers half the time, even game, even after games, and Madison has to sit there and take it, so yep. uh, kudos to her. But You should see me at home from 6 to 8 p.m., <laughs> Monday through Friday. See, I've always, okay. Like, I might not even have boxers on. Really quick, because I've always wondered this, um, when... I think it was probably Chisholm Holland, your producer on the drive. I asked him, so like, does John ever come in? And he's like, no, he just does it from his house. And I was like, he literally does it like in his living room? He's like, yeah. And I just had a thought bubble of you just in your boxers, just like, oh, yeah. Um, Lincoln Riley said this today, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. uh, it sounds that, that sounds like the way to go. Sounds real professional, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> we, we've got them all fooled. Uh, the video has changed things a little bit. Uh, I used to get off the treadmill, like, you know, okay, I gotta get this run in. I've been working all day, but I gotta get this run in before the show tonight, or it's gonna be 10.30, I'm gonna be on the treadmill tonight. I'll get off the treadmill sometimes and just try to stop breathing, try to get my heart rate down so I can do the show. Yeah. I'm all gross and I'm all sweaty and I just ran <laughs> three and a half miles, but I'm doing the show. No, I love it. My, my studio slash office is literally like 10 feet from my couch. A trooper, man. Trooper. It's a hard gig. I mean, there, there, are, there are times where you guys have to call me on Tuesday nights, and I'll, I'll forget up, up until like two minutes before. Yeah. And I'm, you know, like you, like I'll, I'll probably be at the gym and just think, okay, I got to get off the treadmill because I can't be like <sighs> the whole time. Yep. But, but enough of all that, all that jazz. Everyone's here for OU football, of course, and it's here. Like I said, Lincoln Riley, of course, spoke to the media today. Alex Grinch, um, it was one of his, not his, the first time he's spoken to the media, of course. Right. Um, but it's, it's, you know, a lot of OU fans kind of first chance to really get a chance to hear what Alex Grinch sounds like, see what, what he's been able to do because of course he spoke to the media before, but he hadn't really um, been on the recruiting trail at that mm -hmm. point. He hadn't really been with the players that he's going to have to coach this year. Yep. And I guess the big thing coming out, at least from my standpoint, from what I listened to, was the uh, the one two nine reps that he <laughs> that he made the uh, uh, players uh, do with uh, strength and conditioning coach Benny Wiley. Uh, of course, OU's defense, past defense, ranked one twenty ninth last year. But I mean, overall, I mean, out, people, out of how many teams? Is there one hundred and thirty two? No, one hundred twenty nine. Oh my God! Last is last. <laughs> it's if you if you ain't if you're last, you're okay. Good job, <laughs> OU. Nowhere to go but up from here. Right. But so I've already seen it a little bit on Twitter, whether it's from fans, even some media members. Um, very impressed with Alex Ranch. I mean, I'm impressed with Alex Ranch. The guy, can, the guy can speak. He seems like a guy that can motivate his players. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we've we've seen coaches come through OU, whether they be head coaches, assistant coaches, that win the press conference. 
the problem is is just the results on the field and I'm just curious what did you come away with uh, I guess vibe wise on how Alex Grinch kind of presented himself to the media how do you think it's going to translate to um, to results on the field um, okay so I, I've been around for a while uh, I'm an old guy now and I've I've got this thing it's an internal mechanism that I whoop. Got one thing uh, destroying another here. <laughs> Sorry about that, podcasters. That's okay. We'll, um, we will fix that. We're, we just had a three hundred dollar camera take a header <laughs> in the car, uh, but we'll fix it up. It's all good. Um, so I call it my BS meter. Okay, I hope that makes sense. My BS meter on some coaches they're they're kind of full of bluster and they're kind of full of themselves and they kind of think they've got all the answers right. Well. Uh, my BS meter is pretty low on Alex Grinch. He's not a lot of bluster. He reminds me of an old school ball coach. Um, he's going to come in. He's got a way of doing things. He's got a standard that he wants these guys to meet. And in talking with, uh, you know, Neville Gallimore and uh, just, I mean, Trey Brown and, uh, gosh, I talked about six or seven defensive guys today. They're They're impressed in that, they thought they were playing hard. They thought they were giving effort. They thought that they were, you know, um, doing what they've always done as football players. And Alex Grinch comes in and says, no, 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 no. Let me show you this, this loaf. You were loafing on, on film. You didn't give effort. You had a bad attitude. Here's what I saw. And guys are, are taking to that. Guys who have played football all their lives, remember. They're taking to that and they're saying, he's right. I'm not the player that I, I'm not playing like the player that I thought I was. I thought I was somebody else, but this new coach is coming in here and he's getting more out of me. Uh, gosh, Ronnie Perkins said something about, you know, the, we want to see, you know, coach, coach Grinch is coming in and he's getting out of us, the players that we thought we were in high school. We, we were all four stars, five stars, whatever come in here and you know the 129th ranked defense in the country well what happened Alex Grinch is able to tap into what those guys were previously and get them to live up there to their potential now does it translate onto the field on Saturday nights or Sunday nights here if you, in a month uh, does it translate onto the field I don't think it has to translate onto the field necessarily with um, they don't have to be the 15th ranked defense in the country not when Lincoln Riley's calling plays, not when Lincoln Riley is coaching quarterbacks uh, and designing the offense. They just have to not be last. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're running a fitness drill or conditioning drill is in soccer or, or football or basketball, the coach is screaming at you, don't be last, don't be last. Hey, oh, you football defense, don't be last. <laughs> don't be last and you'll be fine. I really think if they can get ranking-wise into the – 60s, 70s, 80s. Now, that's mediocre, and nobody around Oklahoma wants to settle for mediocrity. Mediocre would be a miracle of a change. What, a, what an achievement that would be. Yeah. To go from in the hundreds in just about everything to middle of the road in just about everything. I think that's Alex Grinch's uh, big big directive now. Yeah, and, and it's something where, like, of course, I don't want to try and get ahead of ourselves because this is just day one yeah. of a process that... Like we can we can be even past the OU Texas game and still not be completely sold on mm -hmm. the defense one way or another. Now if they're terrible, right. Houston, UCLA, and then Texas shreds them, then we'll, we'll, it's probably safe to say like yeah, this is going to be a much longer of a process. But if they showcase like some some good things here and there and they flash some positivity, we're still going to hold out until November. And then especially if they end up playing in the Big Twelve Championship, mm -hmm. getting back to the playoff, a lot is still ahead of this defense. But the thing that I've been trying to think of is how much, and Lincoln Riley kind of talked about this as well, is just culture change. And I, I've just been curious because I've, I've tried to remember a few instances where a team has been basically one side of the ball short. And all it took was just a, a different voice just to maybe give that, that side of the ball just yeah. the extra oomph. Because whatever Mike Stoops was selling over the last few years, the, the players were not buying. Yeah. Like they would buy in in the offseason, which is why all this sounds good right now. But until like players make mistakes, how do they how do they bounce back off of yeah. making mistakes? And I'm just curious because at the end of the day, OU's defense has a certain talent cap, and especially with the depth on the defensive line, especially with the depth at linebacker with Caleb Kelly now missing fall camp. 
I, I'm just curious, once those mistakes start to pile up, can they overcome them? And that's where I think Alex Grinch's true test is going to lie as the defensive coordinator this year. Yeah, and Kenneth Murray um, answered that question when I asked him. I said, you know, you guys got down on yourselves a lot last year. Right, yeah, he said, we did. Things go sideways, you get down on yourself. You miss a tackle, you get down on yourself. Blow a coverage, you get down on yourself. How do you prevent that from happening this year? He said, uh, listen to the coaching, work through it, go back to the basics. I mean, he was very fundamental about his approach. Like, he knew this was going to happen, and he said, it's going to happen again. We're going to get, things are going to happen in a game, somebody's going to score a touchdown, we're going to get down on ourselves, but you got to go back to the drawing board, you got to go, you got to attack it from a fundamental standpoint. Okay, here's what we did wrong. Don't anybody lose your cool. There's no screaming, no cussing going on. You know, I mean, it, it no, matters. Nobody's getting in a fight in the locker room. Nobody's getting in a fight in the locker room, <laughs> allegedly. Halftime. <laughs> no, it's... Hey, it's real quick, something that I think will be helpful to the Oklahoma defense this year, and I'm not laying this off as an excuse. I'm, I'm saying this is probably going to happen. I wrote about this a little bit for Sporting News. The Big 12 this year is going to, just because it is, just because that's the way it's going to be, going to regress to the mean offensively. Yep. Lincoln Riley doesn't have Kyler Murray. He doesn't have Baker Mayfield. He's got Jalen Hurts. You can expect a little bit of coming back to the middle. <coughs> um, go to Texas. Is Sam Ellinger really going to throw for 4,000 yards? Come on. Yeah, because Texas – Texas can be one of the best teams in the, in the country. They can be one, yeah. one or the second best team in the conference. Their offense isn't going to blow you away. They're, exactly. going, to, they're going to win because of their physicality, mm -hmm. not necessarily because of their <laughs> finesse. And if Matt Rule at Baylor had his way, he, he's a, he was a linebacker for Joe Paterno. Yeah. I mean, he's gonna, he, he, his favorite coach to, to coach under, Tom Coughlin from the New York Giants. He wants his offense to look like that. Mm -hmm. um, Cliff Kingsbury's gone. Dana Holgerson's gone. Now, the guys that are coming in behind them, Matt Wells and, and Neil Brown, they're going to do a good job offensively. They're offensive-minded coaches. They come from the Mike Leach tree, but they're not Kingsbury and, and Dana Holgerson. Let's be honest about that. Uh, and, and it's that way throughout the Big 12 Conference. Matt Campbell teaches. What does he teach at, at uh, Iowa State? Does he teach tempo, wide open, completion percentage? No, he teaches tackling. He teaches fundamentals. Gary Patterson is still a defensive genius. Yeah. Chris Kleiman, now the new coach at Kansas State, was a defensive was a defensive player, defensive coordinator, defensive genius. Um, you, when you consider where he is, he going to come in and start throwing the ball seventy times a game in Manhattan? Absolutely not. And then uh, uh, Les Miles at Kansas, of all the coaches, Les Miles comes in. What he did the past fifteen years at LSU is he going to throw the ball 50, 60, 70 times? Absolutely, never, zero percent chance of that happening. So. All those numbers, all those running plays, all those emphases on defense, it's going to make the Oklahoma defense look a little more respectable. I just think that's going to be a natural byproduct of the Big 12. Yeah, your point is well taken. The problem I think I'm, I might have, let, let's say if the defense doesn't make that drastic mm -hmm. jump into just being average, which right. is as sad as that sounds, that's, that's what OU has to do. But let's say that they, they don't make that jump, the problem is going to be, yes, there, there's coaching turnover. Yes, there's a little bit of a talent drop-off in terms of, like, the Big 12 is basically depending on OSU's quarterback to be a guy. Uh, maybe Austin Kendall showcases that he was actually a very talented quarterback in his own mm -hmm. right yep. and that he can lift up West Virginia. The problem for OU is going to be they were lit up by everybody no matter how <laughs> good right. they were. That's true. So the talent can drop off in the conference. Yeah. It's still going to be... If OU is giving up routinely 500 yards a game, and we're in the middle of October, that it just gets to a point of no return where that's just what you are. Yeah. And that's the big test, like like I like I said earlier for Alex Grinch is, it's going to happen because OU's defense, talent wise, I don't I think it's fair to say it's not where they want it to be. Yeah, um, I did ask a couple of players about that as well. Um, you guys were four stars, five stars in high school. Everybody wanted you. Everybody recruited you. <clears throat> Uh, how do you get back to that? How do you, you know, um, how do you hit your potential that ever everybody, every coach, every recruit, Nick, or every recruiting follower, or whatever, everybody thought these guys were fantastic when OU signed them. So they get to here, they get a little coaching, and now they're not fantastic. I asked uh, Neville Gallimore, I said, when did you guys become terrible football players? Because, you know, you're not. 
right? I mean, that's got to be the way the mindset works for the for the uh, Oklahoma defense. And and they're to a man, I think they're pretty pretty excited to to show and prove we're not bad players. We're we're going to get some coaching. We're going to play some technique, and we're going to show you guys that we're good football players. It's as simple as that to me. I mean, it is just because um, even even though the talent there isn't there, even though the depth isn't there. I mean, you you look at a guy like Kenneth Murray. Yeah. He's on the preseason. He's on pretty much every single defensive preseason award watch list, and I think a lot of that is just because he's a returning. You know, he's a third year starter, mm -hmm. and he just he looks like a guy. He just mm -hmm. looks like a dude that's that should be playing on Sundays consistently. Yeah. Um, and he was great in high school, and the NFL is drooling over him right now. Where's the disconnect? Yeah, I mean, for it's Kenneth Murray, coaching, for, he got the past three for years. For his pro prospects, I, I would assume you're just hoping that I'm, I'm just surrounded by – I'm just in a bad defense. It's not – because we've seen – on the offensive end of the ball, we've seen quarterbacks come from average offenses become great pros in the NFL. So there's there's there is talent. It's just not where, the, where OU wants it to be. Um, but, again, I, I guess the other side of the coin with uh, OU's defense is just the defensive backfield and how loaded it is. And I believe you asked Alex Grinch about mm -hmm. that. Just uh, what were your thoughts basically from – because this Alex gave – from the limited amount of time we've been able to hear him speak, I would say probably just a, a at this point a cliched Alex Grinch answer in that there is competition. That's yeah. what we want. I don't know if that's necessarily what you actually want going into – your first game against Houston, who, yes, oh, he's going to be heavily favored, but Houston's offense packs quite a punch. He did say, and I was impressed by this, uh, Alex Grinch said that, yeah, in a perfect world, you want two starters at safety. And you want those guys to play every snap because they're that much better because they're really good players and they're that much better than the guys behind them. If they're, that, if they're not that much better than the guys behind them, then you got problems. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, there's great, it's wonderful, it's competition, everybody's the same. But if you don't have two guys at the safety position, or three, who are head and shoulders above everybody else, because they're that good, that create yeah, it creates competition. Competition's great. But it creates a tangle. And that's what they've got right now. I've got my media guide right here. I've got my cheat sheet. Let's just go across the board. Parnell Motley has been a uh, productive cornerback at OU. He's also gotten burned repeatedly. Um, I will say for Parnell Motley, and we, we talked about this earlier, he's one guy that I will say, yes, he's had terrible games. Yeah. He doesn't let it affect him. Right. He, he usually bounces back. That's the mentality that this defense needs, and that's why I've always kind of just assumed Parnell's going to be out there the majority yeah. of the time. And you at, at corner, I really honestly, I think there's one guy at corner, maybe in, in the entire defensive backfield, who is definitely going to start and is definitely going to be productive and is definitely going to turn in plays, be reliable, as reliable as you can be, and that's Trey Brown. I think his natural ability, his closing speed, his ability to deliver uh, an impact at the football uh, sets him apart. Uh, Trey Norwood is a guy. I talked to him today. You know, he's, again, like He's Motley. got experience. He's got experience. <laughs> And, and this is what I was talking to the DBs about today, was not all those experiences are good. There's a lot of experience that they've had that are, that are bad. And guys, every guy that I talked to was like, yeah, we, we're going to grow from that. That's going to, you know, you can't just go through life with everything going good for you. You've got to experience some, some turmoil and some adversity. This, this defense, these DBs have had plenty of adversity. Um, a guy who stood out in the spring that I think will eventually become a star here, especially under the new coach's new system, is Justin Broyles. But he's a sophomore who played in, what, 11 games last year? Got a couple of starts, got a handful of starts. Uh, Robert Barnes is a guy who has looked at times very reliable. He's also looked at times like he doesn't know what to do. It's, it's, one, it's, it's from one side to the other. It's all five positions. Buki Radley-Hiles. Walks out there and looks like he's like, oh my God, he's an axe murderer. You know, <laughs> he's the next Roy Williams at a, in a smaller package. And then other, there's other times where you're like, he doesn't, he doesn't know where he's supposed to be. He doesn't know who his man is. He doesn't know who he's guarding. It's he a, doesn't know what the assignment is. It's a size thing. I mean, for Buki, for him, it's for, a challenge. For Buki and even Justin Broyles, it's it's a size thing. Yeah. Which, I guess mentally they can have it. I guess in practice they can understand where they need to be. 
But it just gets down to a point where, like, I keep flashing back to OU Texas last year in the Cotton Bowl where they would routinely send Buki on just a nickel blitz, and he mm-hmm. would just get eaten alive yeah. by the left tackle to the point where he would just stop. Yeah. Because it's just a size thing. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, that's what this is what OU has to play with. <laughs> the problem is, and I guess trigger warning for OU fans, I guess they did, I guess Grinch did say that Buki is going to play nickel. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> it's not strong safety. <laughs> they'll they'll do what they can to get mi- their athletes on the field. Minimize his inabilities, minimize his weakness. Um, something else he said, Alex Grinch, today that kind of caught my attention. And then you got all these young guys coming in. Yeah. Meaning, we've seen what all these other older experienced guys can do. I want to see what these young guys can do. Because yeah. if the young guys get out there, and this has been kind of a curse for the Oklahoma defensive backs the past few years, freshman gets out there, young guy gets out there, and he looks really good. You remember the true two trays two years ago? Get out in there late in the season, and they're like, "Well, why weren't they playing these guys? These guys, these guys are good." Trey Norwood and Trey Brown get a little coaching in them, get their minds clouded, start thinking too much, mm-hmm. start an- it's called analysis by paralysis. Start overanalyzing things, and what happens? They become average players. That's and so I w- it wouldn't surprise me to see these young guys get chances on the field. And we're talking about guys like Jamal Morris. He's an early enrollee. You've got a four-star in Jeremiah Cradell, uh, another one in Jaden Davis. Again, I'm using my cheat sheet here, but um, I think they're very. The coaches are very pleased with the recruiting defensive backs uh, recruiting class that they've got. Now they want to see if they can play. Yeah, and I'll pull this out of my back pocket. Like one of the main things I was looking for um, coming out of spring football was I need to hear a guy's name like Miguel Edwards. Mm-hmm. If I don't hear anything positive about and. We, we've heard coaches glow about certain players, and it's just coach speak. But I just needed to hear that somebody like at the level of Miguel Edwards was making strides because it would make me feel better about, A, the depth, and then, B, okay, it allows some of these younger players like a Cradell, who was a highly touted uh, guy coming out of high school that Leakin Riley was fired up about um, getting. Mm-hmm. It, get, it allows these freshmen and redshirt freshmen a little bit more time into the season to kind of get things clicking with uh, game speed, with film, um, but because you didn't hear anything on those mid-level guys, it yeah. just, okay, the second that OU gets burned in some game, and it could <laughs> be very well be Houston, then you could see against South Dakota a completely different defensive backfield. And, and in my opinion, I just don't know if that's the kind of the recipe you want where it's just every week it's a different combination mm-hmm. of guys. And like I'm sure Grinch would agree, but that's just kind of the cards he's dealt right now. That's exactly right. Um, there there will be changes, and there may be some wholesale changes in the defensive backfield this year. Very unlikely to me that four or five guys are going to emerge in training camp in the month of August. It's going to be a, a trial by fire kind of thing. Yeah. And I guess before we get onto the offensive end of the ball, just any other details? I know uh, Jalen Redmond is a yeah. go, which is, I mean, thank God for him. That's that's bigger than football, of course. Mm-hmm. Um no, nobody, everybody doesn't question the talent, of course, and oh, you certainly needs him. So that's that's going to be good moving forward. Uh, he's g- good to go for fall camp, right? That's what Lincoln Riley said. That is uh, exactly what Lincoln Riley said, and Alex Grinch took it a step further. Um, said he's got some of that uh, big, quick, yeah, that that we need. <laughs> In other words, he's a big guy, big bodied guy, thick through the shoulders, big chested dude who's strong but also has very quick feet, very quick first step, very quick around the the tackle, around the edge. Uh, I think they're thinking that if he's, you know, game fit, match fit, so to speak, if he's ready to go, he's going to be an impact player. Yeah. That, just listening to them talk, again, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't, I haven't seen him play myself. Uh, Obviously, we haven't seen anything yet. It's August, what, 2nd. But to hear them talk, He's he could be an impact guy, and the thing about that is, coaches aren't going to say, okay, this guy who was injured, his life was in danger, he lost weight, uh, couldn't play last year. Yeah, he's ready to go. <laughs> They're not going to say that unless you know for sure he's ready to go. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's kind of it's kind of a weird situation with OU's defensive line because if you just go by their top four guys, Kenneth Mann, Neville Gallimore, mm-hmm. which. Say what you want about Neville Gallimore. Everybody knows that he's an athletic 
pro he's a freak. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with him is just staying healthy and then playing through some of these little nagging injuries and being consistent. Kenneth Mann, he's he's been a guy that would go into a season the last two years, it seems like, with a lot of excitement, and that would taper off. But I don't know how much of that was just him individually and just the defensive unit as a whole. And then, of course, you got Ronnie Perkins, Jalen Redmond. The talent on the defensive line is there to be above average in the Big 12, of course. The mm -hmm. problem is, if any of those guys gets hurt, get hurt. Yeah. If any of those guys has a high ankle sprain and have to miss you know, three or four weeks of football, like OU is hurting on the defensive line. And we've seen that's how you can cover up a, a kind of a shoddy defensive backfield right. is if you just create pressure. And OU has the guys that on paper can create pressure. If they can do that, then uh, the defensive backfield has a little bit more leeway to learn and grow and be athletic. But, I mean, these are a bunch of what-ifs, and we're already we're still on the defensive end of the ball. The front three uh, slash four slash five guys who are going to be counted on to hold down the line, the defensive line, you're right, they're pretty set. I think you can roll Dylan Fatamata in there uh, for the most part. I think he's going to be a guy that's reliable. Yeah. You know, he's not going to have – 21 tackles for loss or anything like that. He's not going to have eight quarterback sacks, but he's going to be reliable. And that's where this thing starts. You know, blame the DBs if you want, and they get a lot of the, the blame for it. But if the defensive line is coming off the snap and just standing around, those DBs are going to be under pressure. Those DBs are going to be under fire from opposing quarterbacks. And you're right, Big 12 Conference offenses regressing to the mean or not, if your DBs are under pro under fire like that, they're going to get roasted. So, John, if, it all starts up front. If the defense gave us five seconds to stand in the pocket and find a guy that was open, we could hit a guy for 20, a 20 yard game. I think I could be about a 55% passer <laughs> with that much time. I mean, who is Iowa State's third string quarterback who's not even, is he even playing football anymore? I don't think so. What was his name? You're talking about Kyle Kemp? Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> Whatever. Let, let, we, let's get to the offensive side of the ball before. He's their I... offensive quality control assistant now. So he was a senior. Was yeah, he a yeah. red, red shirt senior? Yeah, senior? He was a sixth year senior. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. We need to get to the offensive end of the ball before I lose my mind. Yeah. Um, really quick, any inkling on who the starting quarterback day one will be John Hoover? Gosh, I mean, it's it's pretty much a <laughs> coin toss between three coins. Um, I know that, uh, was it Bovada or no, it was Bet Online that had Jalen Hurts as a 1 to 15 betting favorite. Shout out Chisholm Holland, but I probably knew that. Yeah, 1 to 15. Uh, I got that email a couple of days ago. We talked about it on our show. So you'd have to bet, to, to win $100, you'd have to bet $1,500. To win a dollar, you'd have to bet 15 Those are not good odds if you're if you're playing the if you're playing the, the money. Uh, clearly, Vegas thinks, and Vegas isn't in the uh, isn't in the business to lose money. Vegas clearly thinks that uh, uh, Jalen Hurts is going to be the quarterback. And if you've talked to Jalen Hurts, if you were sitting in the in the press area when he came in and said, "What's up, y'all? Jalen Hurts, peace. I'm here to make an opening statement." <laughs> Nobody in the history of OU football has ever done. Not even Brian Bosworth walked in and said, "I've got something to say." <laughs> so, and that's not a knock on him in any way, shape, or form. That is a, a confidence and a maturity and a leadership that is inborn within him that it just it's just going to come out. You talk to the guys today and you talk to receivers, you talk to tight ends, and it goes something like this. Oh, yeah, Jalen's been terrific in the offseason. Jalen's been organizing the, t the throwing activities, and Jalen's been calling us and doing all this stuff, and I think he's going to be great. He's going to have a good chance to, to you know make all-conference teams, and he's going to – He's going to be having an outstanding year, and he's, he's, there's some urgency because he's only got one year here at OU, and so he's yeah he's really looking forward to you know getting us another Big Twelve title and back to the playoff if he wins the job. That is, that's what they all said. <laughs> if he wins the job, of oh, course he's going to win the job. It's like it's like they answer the question yeah. and they look over at Mike Howe <laughs> and he just kind of gives them a look. I mean, if if he wins the job, of course. Yeah. Yes. No, um, I think I may have mentioned this to you on the like. Um, one of my Tuesday night hits on the drive where I there mainly to talk about the Thunder. You threw me a bone and asked me a know you football question, which thank you for that. I appreciated it. Um, <laughs> Got to pitch the podcast. <laughs> um, I, I will say this. It's it's silly. Everybody knows who's going to try out their, you know, snap one, game one. Everybody knows. Everyone's known that since Jalen Hurts wrote in the Players' Tribune that he was transferring to the mm -hmm. University of Oklahoma. I will say, I mean, there is, I guess there is some type of honor in Lincoln Riley's, I guess, decision to write it out as much as possible because, yeah, 
if I if I'm a player on this team, um, especially a lower level player, you you want to see guys that haven't been a part of the program for as long as some of the older vets that have been there, you know, since their freshman years. You don't want to see somebody just waltz in and be handed everything because uh, maybe that sets the wrong message. I don't I don't know. I mean, these guys are. I mean, we say that they're kids, and some of them technically are, yeah. but they're adults, and they've been through big-time football programs in high school. They're playing at a big-time football program right now where you don't necessarily have to have your hand held emotionally all the time. But I guess just for public show, there is some honor in Lincoln Riley's decision to just no Tanner Mordecai and uh, Jalen Hurts. They're very much in a quarterback battle, hmm. and until it gets to a point where I feel like that he's earned it, then... I, it's going to be a quarterback battle, but make no mistake. I mean, everybody knows. Do you think Tanner Mordecai was in January looking forward to competing with Austin Kendall for the starting job? <laughs> Do you think Austin Kendall was looking forward to competing with Tanner Mordecai for the starting job? Yeah. Yeah, no question. And then Jalen Hurts shows up, and Kendall's like, I'm out of here. Well, I think Austin, I mean, I think Austin needs to figure out how to catch the snap first before, uh, you know, he gets a little frustrated. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think let's just get past the whole who's going to be the starting quarterback. Um, my question, and this is kind of a broad thing um, with you, is just the, the change in the offensive philosophy and play calling mm-hmm. with a Jalen Hurts because Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, yes, they're, they're somewhat dissimilar, but they're pretty much the same. They're... They're both scrambling quarterbacks. They create off of the run. Kyler, of course, is a sprinter and can create more plays with his legs than Baker Mayfield can, but they're both accurate pocket passers that can move around. Jalen Hurts, you know, the jury is still out on him in terms of his ability to pass consistently. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I'm most excited for just watching OU's offense turn out this year is when it gets down to a point where, okay, the passing just isn't there, okay, Big 12 linebackers, tackle this guy yeah Jalen Hurst quarterback rush quarterback power he's a big thick guy uh we were standing on the the sideline in the end zone Sam Mays and myself uh at the Orange Bowl and uh Sam said look how thick his thighs are he's got what <laughs> the N- Campbell. <laughs> yeah well, he's got what the NFL calls a bubble meaning when you see him he's got this big bubble okay so he's a he's a big he's muscular is what I'm getting at all right he's muscular he's thick he's strong he's powerful to me, uh, Kyler Murray last year rushed for a thousand yards. You think, well, damn, he was a he was a runner. He was a running quarterback. He barely did though. It was thousand and one, yeah. thousand and four, something like that. He didn't. So many of his rushing yards were improvised, not by design. Lincoln Riley's like, this guy's five foot ten, one hundred ninety pounds. I'm not going to call running plays for him. Mm-hmm. He did a couple of times, a handful of times per game. But for the most part, it was Kyler Murray being the gingerbread man. Try to catch me best you can. I'm the gingerbread man. Whatever however that goes. Uh, Jalen Hurts. Okay, Jalen, let's run uh, ISO lead uh, in the A-gap, and you're going to knock the linebacker on his ass. That's what. That's the difference in the two styles. Yep. Ky- Kyler's going to sit back in the pocket. If it doesn't develop, he's going to dance around and make – you know, make some moves and, and buy some time. And if it still doesn't develop, he's gone. And it's a anywhere from a 10 to a 50-yard game. Mm-hmm. Jalen is going to uh, call a play. He's going to he's gonna uh, look for, you know, the, the receiver that's open. The receiver's not open. He's not going to have a problem with tucking the ball under his arm, busting through a defensive end, uh, and getting four yards or getting two yards or getting positive yards of some kind. It's just he's a different mentality, and he's a different skill set. Mm-hmm. And I really think that there's going to be a lot of that because when you consider he's trying to absorb a new offense, a new scheme, a new quarterback's coach, a new system, a new route trees, new receivers, everything is still going to be new to him. He's going to be a lot more comfortable tucking the ball under his arm and running. Mm-hmm. I look for him to, to be a real factor on the ground this year. Yeah, and I think I think Jalen Hurts silenced. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something real quick. Real quick story from the interview. Somebody was asking if he met Coach Switzer. Oh, here we go. <laughs> he, met, he met Barry Switzer. Yeah, I met Barry Switzer. He's a funny guy. He's a good guy. I like to, and, then he, and then he started talking. He said, I would I would like to have played for him. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, what a wishbone quarterback this guy would have made. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh man. I mean, him or Kyler, it would have been just born 20 year 20 yeah. 25 years a little too late, but um I, I guess it, for me and a lot of people that watch the spring game, I think Jalen Hurts probably silenced a lot of people that thought he just does not have the arm at all. Whether that's accuracy or arm strength, mm -hmm. you know, there were a lot of people that went into that game wanting to see that. I think he showcased that he has an arm, mm -hmm. and I don't know, I don't know how much of a minimal difference this is going to be because so much of Lincoln Riley's offense with Baker and Kyler was so timing based, quick routes, yep. quick decisions. The thing with Jalen Hurts is his throwing motion is it's a tad on the slow side. Right. It's a little bit of a wind up. He's a bigger guy like you described. Um, everyone that watched him play at Alabama, you know, this isn't a revelation or anything. But I'm curious how much that changes the play calling and the decision making because I feel like this is going to be a much more methodical offense. But I don't want people to think that, okay, oh, he's going to score. Instead of in the 40s on average, they're going to average in the late 20s, early, like low 30s. Like, that's not going to be the case, of course. If that's the case, then no, he's going to lose some games. Yeah. But um, I just I, I can just see, I foresee like a much more methodical offense, and I'm really curious on how that dicta dictates the success because uh, we've seen the last two, three years, OU's offense was so good and so fast-paced, and it made up for the fact that their defense was just hot garbage a lot mm -hmm. of the times. A couple of, uh, of thousand-yard rushers two years ago. With, yeah, not uh, to mention Trey Sermon and Kennedy right, Brooks with, like adds to this. Exactly. With with you put Mixon and uh, P. Ryan in the same backfield, it took Lincoln half a season to figure out how to work them both in at the same time, how to get them both plenty of touches, how to make them both <clears throat> effective and efficient players for the offense. So now you've got Sermon and Kennedy Brooks, and you add the running element of uh, of Jalen Hurts. We might be seeing an entirely different offense. Not, not it, you know, it's not going to be like, uh, you know, it, here's the bottom line. If Lincoln can't call plays, the same plays for Jalen Hurts that he called for Kyler and Baker, then he won't call them. He's not going to go square peg round hole on this thing. It, he's going to allow Jalen Hurts every opportunity to succeed with his own skill set. It's simple as that. Now consider this. Would you say Lincoln Riley's probably a top five quarterbacks coach in the country, offensive coordinator in the country. I think it's fair to say. Fair to say. He will be the fifth offensive coordinator and the fifth quarterbacks coach that Jalen Hurts has had in, yeah, in four seasons. I mean, at any level, you've seen that effect in, in the worst possible way. Yeah. A lot of good quarterbacks, potentially good quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, even everybody knows Sam Bradford in yep. his early NFL career where he had three different head coaches, four different offensive coordinators in yep. five years. and it affected what could have been a pretty solid NFL career. So that's going to be something to, to look forward to. But you've just got to gotta err on the side of Lincoln Riley, I think, with this one, just because he's such an understanding quarterback coach. He knows how to get the best out of his guys. That He's, he's going to put Jalen in situations where, like, if you don't like what you see in that first second or two, take off. No. No, because that... like, the deep, like Lincoln Riley said, no one really keeps him up at night in this in this conference, so that confidence probably trickles down to him. So if you don't like what you see, take off, because no one's probably going to tackle you on the first hit. That's exactly right. Um, don't don't be in a hurry. If you're Lincoln Riley, you're probably communicating to Jalen Hurts. Don't be in a hurry to get out of the pocket because something's going to open up. No defense in the country has been able to slow down or even stop in any measure this offense the last three years. They've had, the last two years has been number one in the country. So if he can impart to Jalen a measure of patience and a measure of trust with his receivers, with the system, with the playbook, whatever, uh, eventually Jalen will become comfortable with what's going on. Every, he, he He's not worried about coverages. He's not worried about the speed of the game or anything like that that a new quarterback frequently has to deal with. He's worried about... Uh, is that receiver going to break that route off like Jerry Judy did when I was in Tuscaloosa? Is he going? Is he going to see that coverage the same that I'm seeing it and break it off into a, a instead of a, a, a post? Is he going to run it out right there? Yeah. Where based on where the the cornerback's shoulders are pointing this way or that way, right? That's how these guys think on that level. So, with everything being so new, he's going to need that that um, time. And, and that's what we talked about today was the rapport that, that happens in the summer. Uh, I asked him, I said, where, where, how does that develop? And he said, a lot of early mornings and a lot of late nights. And I go, 
I said, late nights? I said, what are you, what are you talking about late nights? Like video games and, and uh, Netflix? I said, are you guys like bonding? He goes, no, man, we're working. Late nights in the Everest. Late nights in the Switzer Center. Mm-hmm. Going down there, you know. Grant Calcaterra said they give us the keys and we go in there whenever we need to and everybody's getting their work done. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why Blake Griffin wanted to come to OU was because his brother Taylor had the keys to, yeah. the, uh, to the gym late at night. Very so, cool. Um, no, I mean, timing, that's always going to be something that a new quarterback playing with new receivers, new running backs, that's going to take some time. And I, that's why, and I guess really quick before we get out of here, John, because I know you're a busy man, but um, I, I think Houston presents probably the best case scenario of an opponent for this OU team because I think this, this game's going to go one of two ways. Either it's going to go like last year's, uh, what, FAU game where we talked – over and over again about how talented they are. Lane uh-huh. Kiffin, you know, their offense Remember. is one of the best offenses in the country last year. It's going to be a challenge for this defense, and then OU just destroyed them because yeah. OU was a bad team. Um, we could see maybe something similar to that this this season with Houston. We all know the offensive talent they possess. Uh, Dana Holgerson, of course, has uh, experience losing to Oklahoma a lot <laughs> over the last um, eight, nine years. Um, it could go that way, and of course, it can go the way of no. Houston's actually got that offensive talent, mm-hmm. and this defense is going to be a work in progress, as we talked about earlier. And I think that that probably presents the best case scenario for Jalen Hurst to basically learn quickly on this is what you're going to be dealing with. You've got the offensive talent, and there's going to be some games where you're you're going to be in a situation where you should be three possessions ahead, but you're not. So every little play counts. Every little timing route counts. Every little decision where I don't like it, so I'm going to take yeah. off counts and sliding, going out of bounds, protecting your body. I think Houston could present possibly the best case scenario for OU's overall team moving forward. Yeah, you you talk about the transition. Let's consider for a minute that what Lincoln Riley said about last year's quarterback competition is accurate, and that is that uh, Kyler Murray barely, 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 and I mean narrowest of margins, beat out Austin Kendall. What could have been? That means Austin Kendall was probably arguably the second best quarterback in the country last year, right? Mm-hmm. He just couldn't beat out the guy in front of him. Now, can you imagine rolling Austin Kendall out there against Houston? Austin Kendall having very, very minimal playing time over the years. And he rolls out there with essentially Creed Humphrey and a bunch of guys. And that offensive line that, that Oklahoma is going to roll out there. By the way, Michael Thomas uh, is a guy that I'm intrigued by. Um, that would, to me, that would not be pretty. Austin Kendall, nothing against him. It's just that he hasn't seen that before. They brought in the perfect guy. You couldn't bring in a more perfect candidate to be your grad transfer starting quarterback than Jalen Hurts to walk out there and say, these guys are my offensive line? All right, I'll do it. I mean, it's not going to be pretty, but I'll do it. Yeah. I mean, he's gotten that stuff done before. That's what's that's what's so impressive to me about the guy is he's his the timing uh, of everything that he's, you know, um, of, of his arrival here, uh, the one year that they need a quarterback couldn't couldn't be better. No, and the the other thing, the other scenario is he's been in so many big games. He's been in so many different environments, yep. hostile environments, and. I know the stories are going to come um, if OU is undefeated going into the Cotton Bowl against Texas. Oh, new quarterbacks in this series are, what, 2-20 uh, in their first OU-Texas game? Yeah. I don't know if that rule necessarily applies to Jalen Hurts because he's been in Alabama-LSU games in That's Death right. Valley at night. He's been in national championship games. He's been in SEC title games. He's been benched. He's come off the bench in these big games. I, I just can't think of a scenario where uh, Jalen Hurts just doesn't have it because he's in over his head. He's not going to be in over That's, his head. You could go into a season with Kyler Murray thinking that because yeah. uh, the last time he played football, he was a true freshman mm-hmm. and a little bit in over his head. You could say that a little bit with Baker Mayfield before he became Baker Mayfield mm-hmm. because he's a walk-on. You can't say that about Jalen Hurts. How much that helps OU football this season kind of remains to be seen because a lot of it is out of his hands with the defense and the offensive line development. Yeah, you, you couldn't have said that better. Uh, he, he will not be in over his head. No matter what Houston or Texas or TCU or anybody throws at him, he's seen it. He's seen better players in the SEC over the last three years than he will see defensively across the board in the Big 12. I mean, he, there's nothing that's going to rattle him. There's nothing that's going to scare him. He's not going to be uh, lose his poise. 
the kid the kid's unbelievably mature as well so uh michael thompson was the name i was looking for on the offensive line the uh red-shirted last year got injured moved to offensive line moved to offensive line i asked lincoln riley today if he could if he, is he going to be like a contributor or is he just going to kind of fill in for some depth and he said the idea is i mean we recruited him as an offensive lineman uh the idea is he's going to play so that'll right. that'll be that'll be one that's one yep. you know <laughs> well um john this is our first podcast together so i'm excited for the uh, mm-hmm. season moving forward uh, we will, of course, I, I thought this was pr- probably a, one of the best first shows I've ever done, um, but we'll, of course, get better. We'll turn out some more podcasts for you guys, so hopefully everybody jumps on board and has fun with this, um, and we'll kind of get a better feel for the structure of the show. This was kind of like literally us sitting in my car because we couldn't <laughs> find a good, quiet place after the uh, press conference because Campus Corner is jumping right now. Yeah. Um, I've been out of school for only five years, and I feel like, it, I, I always feel like it's summer perpetually. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's there's not a quiet place around, but we'll get a better structure down. So f- for that, um, I'll just say, like, any final thoughts, anything that we missed that you wanted to touch upon real quick? I'd like to just say uh, I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you uh, thinking of me and including me. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I will. There, there's a video of this podcast if you'd rather watch us. Uh, it's gonna, we're going to throw it up on the website, thefranchiseok.com, at some point. Thank um, God I cleaned my car a few days ago. Yeah, no, it looks great. <laughs> uh, I'm going to recommend getting a uh, power outlet, though. I think my laptop died while I was processing video. Okay. So oh, it, we'll have everything. Hopefully we're not doing it in the car next yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not quite the studio quality, but, uh, but we're making it work. I'm enjoying this. It's going to be good. It's going to yeah. be a good year. It'll be fun to look back. Oh, remember we did it in my car? <laughs> Old times, old times. <laughs> All right, well, everybody, thank you so much for listening to Inside OU uh, Sports, OU Football. I can't remember what it's actually called. It's Inside OU something, but um, we'll figure it out. Um, everybody, thank you so much. Subscribe, retweet, share it, and we will definitely appreciate it. We'll put these out. Um, when John comes to Norman for Lincoln and Riley's press conference during the season, we'll be in person. We'll be putting out pregame stuff uh, during the season, postgame stuff, of course, and then, of course, when, when news breaks. So... It's going to be fun, and we hope that you guys all jump on board and have fun with us. So once again, thank you for listening, and for Mr. John Hoover, this is Brady Trantham signing off. Y'all have a good one.